Hi. Thank you, Nita, uh, for being on the podcast today. Listeners, we have Nita Patel. Uh, she's an artist, a uh, public speaker, and author. We talked a little bit about kind of um, your mindset behind that. I think um, artists and authors, that's usually their communication style. It's kind of is through their work. And so I'd kind of love to hear what you provide uh, with your mediums, like with the, the writing, the public speaking, and the, the artwork. I mean, what, what, it, what does it tell people? Um, yeah, so I think each each item, you know, tells a different story. Each, um, the writing is really to help someone directly in, in terms of how to elevate your life. Um, whereas the art is more energetic healing, you know, it's more color therapy and how it makes you look, how looking at certain colors makes you feel. So I think each medium has kind of a different intention, but all to really help elevate someone else's life. You know, you know it's funny. So I have, a, um, I do, I haven't done it recently, but I have another podcast where it's about mindset, about growth. And my mm -hmm. co-host on that is an artist. And he always talks about the idea that um, like Vince Van Gogh, people are going to be remembered after he leaves and, and things like that. And it's uh, the three different platforms that you use, the three different canvases that you use where you do the public speaking, um, where you're in front of people. And for him, he's kind of an introvert. And his artwork is kind of tells his full story. It seems like you have three sides of the spectrum that I kind of I, I love. It's like, are you very adaptable in like the different environments? Are you a different person? Do you feel when you're in those kind of mediums? Or I don't think it's uh, I don't think I'm a different person. In right. fact, you know, I, I think that the idea of this type of balance has probably not been discussed enough because you're able to. This is kind of a you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you're a right brain person or you're a left brain person. And that's not who we were meant to be. You know, we were meant to use both parts of our brain. So you can be a finance guru and still be able to create art, for example. And so that's, you know, where I see myself as being able to find balance. I do things that entertain my left brain. I do things that entertain my right brain. And kind of going back to what you said, you know, introvert, extrovert as well, right? Being an artist is very introverted. Um, and some days I, you know, want to hide in my studio and just paint and don't want to interact. Um, you know, it's a different type of emotional and creative outlet versus being in front of people, connecting with people, um, sharing messages. They're both inspiring in different ways. But, you know, I, I think that we... As society have an idea that you are just one or the other you know you're just right brained or left brain you're just introverted or extroverted right. and i think the beauty in this is you have balance of everything and so you're not just one way you know you're able to tap into different parts of your brain different parts of your creativity your emotions um and i think it's it's a really fantastic thing that probably should be talked about more and encouraged well how do you so I know a lot of people listening. So the, the podcast is about overcoming diversity, entrepreneurs, starting your business. And I think for a, for a lot of people starting the business, you're trying to figure out what your story is. What are you trying to tell people? What are you trying to get across? And with the different mediums they use, each medium allows people to interpret it in a different way. I think the public speaking would probably be less of interpretation because you're basically straight to the point. You know, you're writing a book, there's still a little interpretation and, and artwork more of an interpretation. Do you feel like you have a, a common story that you're trying to get across through all the platforms? Is it, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. You know, I think it's really to elevate your life, whether it's in your home from the artwork or whether it's emotional, internal, um, I think professional and personal branding is a big part of elevating people's personal and professional brands is a big part of my speaking and as well as my book. And so I think all platforms that I'm moving forward on, they all lead to elevating someone's life. That makes sense. Well, in, in talking about your life, uh, your life from, from what we've talked about before we got on the podcast and only briefly, yeah, you did a lot of moving from from Dallas to the UK, and it seems like back and forth. And I mean, kind of walk us through those 
uh, and it's generalizations yet and it, it feels like they can be a little bit different communities that you'd be transitioning from one to the next yeah yeah i mean talk about learning to be resilient <laughs> you know and especially at a younger age I was born in England and my parents moved to the States um, when I was pretty young. And so they went back and forth a lot through my elementary years. And so I would go to school in London for a year or sometimes six months. <laughs> and then I would spend the other half of the year or the next year in um, in Dallas. And so, and I'm, I don't know if you remember, kids are mean. They're brutally honest. <laughs> they say what this what's on their mind. <laughs> um, so I had a lot of experiences when I went when I made the transition because there was a period where when I came back to the states, I spoke very fluent British English, and all the kids would tell me that they didn't understand me and that I didn't speak English, and I would get so frustrated, <laughs> you know. And I would be like, "You don't speak English. You speak American. You don't even know how to spell your words right," <laughs> you know. But there was a point where I, I had to make a choice, e even as a child, you know, as a a ten year old, an eleven year old, I had to make a choice to say, okay. If I'm going to, if I want to be accepted, if I want to get along, if I want to have friends, instead of people just poking at me all the time, I'm going to have to learn how to adapt. And so that is where I was able to, you know, learn to say, okay, this is how I need to spell the word color when I'm in America. And this is how I need to spell the word color when I'm in London. And I knew it, but I wasn't work I wasn't willing to you know kind of go with that <laughs> until I, I got to the point where I realized that I wasn't gonna have a, a happy every day, especially not in school when you know kids are poking fun at you all the time. Um, how long was the, the back and forth? You said to 10 years old or was it later how, how long was that back and forth for? Um it was probably second grade through sixth grade. Okay. What and I mean, there's. I, I mean, I love the idea of different communities. I love the idea of living in a different land, living in an area. I've been lucky enough to travel a lot, and you you get to learn more about yourself when you live in a different country. Do you? What do you feel were differences living in the UK compared to Dallas? Be it school, be it environment, be it people. Are you seeing differences? Uh, absolutely, uh, and especially back when I grew up. You know, I think the biggest thing was. And one of the reasons I wrote my book is etiquette, you know, what was proper, having discipline, all of those things were very, very important in the UK. And you know, I would come back here and nobody would care what you wore or how you sat or <laughs> um, how you conducted yourself. And so those were some very, very foundational um, differences that I grew up in. And I think that definitely um, paved the way in what I decided to do, you know, after, through my corporate career. Now, when you with etiquette, is that, um, is, I mean, I lived, I lived in London for a short while. I'm trying to think if someone didn't have proper etiquette, would they sell it to their face or would they snicker behind their back? I would, lean more towards the sticker man in the back but um. yeah and i think a lot of times all you needed was a look okay. <laughs> that's all it took I mean, it was a look and it was like oh okay let me <laughs> sit up straight and you know uncross my legs or whatever it was um but sometimes that's all it took you know uh, and and the english teachers were allowed to discipline a oh. lot more <laughs> um Harshly, maybe that's a good word. Oh, and stuff. And um, belt. you know, I, I think they walked around. I remember this one teacher that I had, and she walked around at a certain time of a day, and she had a ruler in her hand. And if somebody did not, you know, if you were not sitting up straight, if you were not exactly how you were supposed to be, you know, they were scared. You know, kids were scared, and, and so it was an automatic. I'm not moving, you know, I'm going to sit still just like this. Uh, but they were allowed to if they needed to. And that would never, ever, you know, that would have never happened here in the States. 
And I guess, I mean, I guess the people listening right now, and probably the next question is, <laughs> you think that we should go back to that? Should we be okay with basically teachers <laughs> uh, disciplining children? Probably not, because I think, um, I feel like my generation grew up with a very fear-based mindset. <laughs> so I wouldn't say that's the best way to raise children. Uh, so, okay, so you're here in San Diego, you're, you're in Dallas now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going to high school, I'm assuming going to college, is that correct? Or mm -hmm. what's the pathway now? So walk me through the rest, walk us through the rest. Um, yeah, so I was pretty much in Dallas for the you know, after that, I mean, I traveled back to see family and, um, you know, when we went on vacation or what have you. But other than that, I pretty much spent the rest of the time in Dallas going to high school, college uh, and even through my corporate career. So you you graduate college, go into the corporate world. What did you do in the corporate world? Um, so I was in technology. Um, a good portion of my corporate career has been in healthcare technology. And, um, you know, I have a psychology background. And so I wasn't too deep into the technical side, but more working with teams, uh, being in manager type roles. So coaching employees, hiring, I did a lot of hiring and interviewing. And um, that was one of the reasons that led me to writing my book was, you know, between how I grew up and how I saw people show up for interviews, how I saw, people show up to an important meeting. I just felt like there was this gap in people not having the awareness of how to present themselves. And um, that was, I went through, it was about a year where our team had hired about 200 people. So if you can imagine how many people we had to interview to hire 200 people and all the you know different types of people that we interacted with, I mean, that was a, that was a real, I think, moment for me to say, I, I felt compelled to share this information at that point. <laughs> like, don't do this, don't do this. You know, if you want to be hired, and not only that, you know, you can get hired if you show up well to an interview, but how do you maintain that once you are accepted in the job that you want? You know, how do you continue growing? Uh, and so that's why I talk a lot about elevating your personal professional brand so that people see you in the light that you wish to be respected, that you wish to be seen as. Were, so you're doing a lot of interviews. Are you making notes on each person, like how you judge them pre, how you judge them post, or how, how are you compiling all this information to uh, put this book together? Um, I, I don't think there was any judgment at the time. I mean, extreme cases, it, might have been like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe, <laughs> you know, she wore this or or he showed up like this. Um, but it was really maybe a few months after that whole process that I realized I have a lot of content here and I have a lot of experiences. Let me start journaling, you know, what I remember and write it all down in case I forget it, um, which I don't have the greatest memory. So <laughs> um, I started taking notes and I just, you know, started writing down incidents of extreme cases for the most part. But I, I think they're storytellers to say, this is what not to do. And this is how you do show up. So you're making, you're, you're making good money in the corporate world, right? And you're building this idea journaling did you know that your end goal was to build this journal into a book i did at that point okay, yeah so you're, so you're building it did you did you look into the process of putting a book together you go let me just get the content down and then figure out the rest later yep yep that's exactly where um because i it felt too scary honestly to figure out how to structure a book and you know start how many chapters do i have what's the title going to be you know instead of messing with all of that i said let me just do a brain dump put everything on paper and that's actually the process that i followed is i did all of that and then i went back and i organized what makes sense you know what stories to keep and how does the information flow and how am i going to be able to help someone ultimately Right. It wasn't just a, a rant. Of, I can't believe um, it, it's about how can I help someone show up better? How can I help someone learn how to listen? 
uh, and communicate with with your teams, with your in your relationships. I, I think the underlying message is the same, right? Whether you're listening to a partner or you're listening to a client, if you don't listen and you're just waiting to respond and you're just you know waiting to talk then you're not really building the relationship. You're not gonna be able to give the client or your partner what they're what they're needing. And so it's not a lasting relationship. So a lot of what I talk about, and that's why I say personal and professional brand, because a lot of what I talk about is, um, it, it can apply to any parts of your life. Now, if you had to, cause someone <laughs> listening right now is maybe thinking about, I wanna put a book together. Right. I have these great stories. I have this idea that I want to get across. If you could redo that time frame of putting that book together, would it still be the same structure of brain dump, figuring out the system, or what, what would you do now? The structure would be the structure would be the same. Um, the time frame would be much more condensed. <laughs> In fact, that's what I'm doing right now is I am launching a program next week, matter of fact, uh -huh. that um, is write your book in 90 days. And um, it's technically 12 weeks, uh, but I have a process that I have kind of laid out, a, a structure, if you will. And um, yeah, brain dump first, you know, then organize, then create chapters out of it, um, and then find reasons of why. You know, you want to tell someone that, hey, wake up at 5 a.m., it's really good for your life, it's really good for your business. But if you don't tell the reader, why they need to do it if you don't share your personal experience, if you don't, you know, give case studies or anything that's relevant to justify your why, they're gonna read that and say, okay, great. <laughs> but if you know you're able to connect with a reader and say, this is how my life changed because I woke up at 5 a.m., you know, that's compelling and that's gonna inspire the reader to make that change in their life. Um, and, and so yeah, I have a very structured um, process that I've created. And because it took me, it took me about two and a half years to write my book mm -hmm. because I, you know, I knew I wanted to write it, but it was a kind of a side project. And I think that's what happens to all of our side projects, right? <laughs> it's the last priority on the list. And, and I think a book is very valuable to your business. You know, it, it gives you, it elevates your brand. It, a lot of times you can be recognized in a field, but you suddenly become a pu published author and now you're a recognized expert, right? Whereas before you were just an expert. Um, did, so did you look at it, the book being more of a support for your business or your future business compared or on a no, or? no, at the time I didn't even know. I, at the time, you know, I just felt like I needed to share this information and that's all it was to me. It, it was a book to share information. It was a book to help people, you know, learn why do you sit up straight? Why should you not slouch in a meeting? <laughs> um, it, it was really just to explain, this is the way that you should act because it's gonna make you feel better. It's not really about the other person or where you're at. I think the old rules of etiquette, if you will, were about society you know there are social rules and so i use the term modern etiquette because this is really about elevating your life it's about making you feel confident when you feel confident you make better decisions and it opens up doors of success and so i really just wanted to share that information i i had no idea i any of this other um stuff would happen as a result of that what what about your your artwork? Were you doing that at, at a young age? Were you also doing this with your book? I mean, what was walking through that or walks through that? Um, so I started the artwork probably maybe a little under ten years ago, and it was really more of a emotional outlet. It was a creative outlet. A lot of what I did at the time was very, you know, left brained, and um, I realized that. I was a very creative person and I was looking for ways. I think the other thing is, and probably other artists who hear this can relate to this, you know, whether you're a musician or you paint or sculpt, is you may not have the words to express what you're trying to share in your life at that time. And you find other ways to express yourself. 
you don't have to speak, you know, and that for me, that was how I started painting. Was so was it was it a very uh, emotional like absolutely like okay. it, it was it was emotional but I think it was also healing because I was not one to talk about myself talk about my um, you know my challenges or anything like that it was very healing for me when I first started creating art and because of what it gave to me you know because of how it healed me, how it helped me uh, come back to life almost. I, I felt that that was something that I wanted to share with, uh, you know, with others. And before I would have all this work created and I would, you know, it would be piled up in, in the house in a room and <laughs> I would have friends come over and, you know, they would ask, what are you doing with this? You know, are you going to sell it? Or are you going to show it? I would be like, no, 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 no. That's just, I just made that just because it's trash, you know, I'm sure I'll throw it away. And they would be like, no, you're crazy. You can't do that. This is great. I'm like, no, I can't show this to anyone. But again, being vulnerable, right? That's, uh, I think being an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to be vulnerable. And so that was a step that I took. And uh, I think after the first time I showed my artwork, I felt so amazed. I was like, this is amazing. I love this. Uh, and, and it was really, you know, seeing people connect with your work and them seeing the emotions that came through the artwork. And um, and so I continued creating when I was inspired. And, um, you know, I, it was I created it to heal others and inspire others. And then when did you start um, selling your pieces? Um, I would say probably about 2015 is when I started selling my artwork. And what was that process like of that first piece being sold? Oh, wow. It was very scary. <laughs> it was very frightening. Um, am I charging the right price? You know, am I undercharging? Am I overcharging? Nine times out of 10 artists undercharge you know, their self-worth. And, and I think that's another reason why I also wrote the book because I went through that experience of learning how, what my self-worth was, you know, and how I priced my art. And um, I know that's something that artists struggle with a lot because you want to share something so bad or you want to sell something and that you undervalue yourself for the sake of, you know, giving it to someone for free, basically. Um, is what ends up happening. And uh, that was a lesson that I learned. And so why I incorporated self is the message of self esteem in my book, uh, and the importance of it. Does is painting and your artwork? Is it still an outlet for times of struggle for you? You know, I think I've found other ways to find balance daily. Um, I do a a lot more spiritual work. I, I meditate, um, you know, exercise, all these different things. I think I, that really helped me maintain balance. Now it's more about getting a very inspired idea and then deciding that I want to create artwork from that idea. And I think it's more of a, I don't know, I'll, I'll say it's a more of a joyous creation um, because I'm excited and I have this, you know, this great thought that came to me. I had a great vision that came to me and I want to create it. What's, what's probably your, your biggest source of income? Is it the public speaking? Is it the artwork? Is it the book? I mean, where does the majority of your, your income or is it pretty evenly distributed? I would say it's pretty evenly distributed, um, specifically between the artwork and uh, my coaching services. Do you? Coaching. Okay. I mean, finding out, we talked about it kind of briefly a little bit, finding out what your worth is, right? How much you charge. I think that's a struggle, like you said. Most artists, and I think most entrepreneurs figure out, I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs where they raise their price and they feel like they have a, better clientele, they get more business. It's just life is better because they finally understand their worth. Um, 
figuring it out, the struggle of knowing, am I charging too much? Am I charging too little? Kind of walk, can you walk us through adapting to each each piece that you're putting out there, be it book, be it post speaking, be it coaching, whatever it might be? Um, yeah, so I will I can share that with my artwork. You know, my first artwork I sold, and I did a lot of inner work <laughs> to be able to do this. You know, I, um, I talked myself up, and uh, my first artwork I sold for $1,200. And um, I was very excited, you know, but after that, it, it went down. <laughs> And I would sell something for $100 or I would sell something for $300. And I couldn't figure out why, you know, what was happening. And that took a journey of personal development to help me understand that I needed to work on my self-esteem. I needed to build my confidence. And, you know, even recently, if I have a piece that is $20,000, if I'm not feeling confident on the day that someone's calling me about it, you know, it's it's a missed opportunity um, because I'm not going to be able to share, you know, that the worth of the the painting. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to, you know, show my artwork around the world in um, in museums and such. And um, so, you know, again confidence is so so important because on a day that i'm feeling confident i have no problem telling someone hey this is how much this painting is worth and when you're confident you know the other person feels your confidence right and and so um and so it, it's easy when you're not confident about yourself you're not going to exude that you know you're going to exude that low self-esteem and so somebody is not going to buy your product uh, what were your services, whatever it might be. With with regards to your confidence, how do you bring yourself up? Because I, I know, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people of the idea of confidence, right? And uh -huh. look at the high moments that you've accomplished, the things you've accomplished, and then it kind of says, okay, this is why I can do X, Y, and Z. This is why I can lift this weight because I've lifted these ones before. This is why I can run this fast because I've ran that fast before. Is that the mindset you go through to, to build your confidence for each um, each day or is there something else you go through, affirmations? What do you do to to help with, with your confidence? Um, I, I think there are different things that, you know, that I've personally practiced. Um, again, meditation has been one of the part of my practices. Um, affirmations has been a part of my practice. I used to do a lot of affirmations at the beginning uh, when I started on my personal development journey. And um, I, I think it's just a variation. You know, some days working out gets your adrenaline pumping. Um, it, uh, it, it can be a hormonal imbalance, you know? And so when you work out, you feel you're feeling good about yourself. And so you feel more confident. Uh, I think there's just so many different ways that um, different things that I've tried. <laughs> Do, is there is the, the meditation probably one of the biggest ones that has helped you the most? You know, I would say setting an intention is really powerful. Um, when you wake up in the morning and you set an intention of how you want to feel that day, I would say that's been the most powerful. Was there ever any ever a moment where you didn't want to write another book, do another painting, not work, you know, not adult as they say, <laughs> you know, uh, what would allow you to kind of push through that if those times ever did pop up? Um, yes, <laughs> I've definitely had those days. Um, and my, I will say my turnaround time was a lot longer, you know, maybe two years ago, uh, maybe even last year compared to today, you know, my turnaround is almost immediate now, but I truly feel like, and the reason I'm able to do that is I truly feel like I'm, I'm living my, I'm in alignment with my purpose and I'm really, I'm truly living my purpose. And uh, I, I think that when you are, you know that that's what you were born to do. Um, 
there's, I don't want to say there's no option of not doing it, but it, it's almost like, well, then what's the point? <laughs> you know, yeah. what are you going to do? Are you going to, you know, go back to a job that is mechanical? Are you going to, you know, what are you going to do? And even if you don't have to work for the rest of your life, I mean, what's the purpose? Why are you going to wake up every day? You know, what is that thing that's going to bring you joy every day? And um, so I think when you find alignment, when you find your true purpose, when you find passion, you're able to, it, it, at that point, it's just a thought. It's like, okay, I need a break. I don't want to do this anymore. But then it's like, okay, you know, tomorrow I'm <laughs> back at it. No, it make, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, knowing that purpose, knowing your why, I mean, makes, gives you a reason that each day you got to push through. I totally, I totally agree with that. Uh, if you could look back at that, that younger, that younger kid, that one that was in fourth grade, fifth grade, that's traveling from the UK to Dallas. I mean, what I kind of work? One more thing yeah. about the last point. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just, um, I thought it was important to share, you know, I think, I also think that at a certain point it becomes, it's not about you anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it's about serving your higher purpose and it's about the other people that you're, you know, here to help. And also when it's no longer about you, um, I, I think that's where the shift occurs as well. Mm -hmm. Cause you're not doing it for yourself. You know, I'm not waking up and, and painting for me, or I'm not waking up and, writing or you know speaking for me i'm doing it to help others and if i stop doing it you know then then that's my loss and so i think it's a shift in perspective also do you when, when that when you're thinking about the others of, of the people you're helping do you put a face to those people or is it just an idea does that make sense um yeah i i don't necessarily put a face to um okay to it. I, I think it's more of an idea because I don't want to limit, you know, who I'm going to be helping. And so for me, when I don't, you know, when it's just an idea, I think you're surprised at who you, who you reach and who you inspire and, um, you know, who's touched by the advice or who's inspired or who's wanting to change their life. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, well, going back to to that to the other question, if you could kind of go go back to that that little kid that was traveling back and forth, that was trying to find their voice, what kind of advice would you give to that little kid? I would say, you know, I think the the whole idea of of being adaptable just just go with the flow. Don't hold on to something from yesterday because that's how we're not able to move forward in life in general because we hold on to our past. And so when you hold on to yesterday, you can't live today and you can't move forward tomorrow. Um, and so it's probably, I, I would have to find a very simple way to say it. Um, well, it's but funny, especially, especially for a little kid that's getting made fun of and getting picked on. You know, kids can be so tough and you take those small words of like, oh, making fun of you. But that person that made fun of you, that bully, probably forgot that they even did that to you. Of and course, so and then you end up being scarred for the rest of your life, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so also a reason that I, you know, incorporate forgiveness in my coaching is so that you can let go of all of your past beliefs and you can let go of things that you've held on to that are holding you back from a, it could be a completely different area of success in your life. Uh, but when you let go of all of that, you're able to move forward. Hmm. If, if we're talking to you, let's say in a, in a year from now, two years from now, what place do you plan to be in? Is there going to be changes to, to who you are, to what you're offering, anything like that? Do you, do you envision anything happening different in the um, next years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I strive to grow as a person every day. And uh, I, I think that's the ultimate purpose in life is to become the best person that you can be. And so from a change standpoint, you know, I wouldn't say that I would change who I am, but maybe being refined is a better word. Um, you know, learning, learning to be better, learning to 
elevate your life in different ways, elevating your consciousness. I think those are all um, certainly important factors as a part of my personal development. Now, this is going to be a probably hard question. All right. If someone's listening right now, okay, what's one telltale sign that they have bad etiquette? <laughs> Oh, this is this is probably the easiest question. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> Where do I begin? How much time do we have? <laughs> um, just anything. <laughs> anything, anything. If they're if they're right now listening, and so we're gonna put the, the the listeners on the spot, and if they they do this thing or this thing on a daily basis, yeah. they might have bad. I idea. would say, I would say, multitasking specifically when you're doing this, you know, you're like heads down <laughs> and, and you, you're acting like you're listening to someone, you're acting like you're present somewhere else, but you're like nose is in your phone, you're in your digital device. <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if you're listening right now and that describes you, you might need to reach out uh, to Nita. Uh, so if they want to reach out to you and, and maybe for your one of pieces, for your coaching, get your book, what's the best platform for them to find you? Um, on my website at nita-patel.com. Okay. And we'll have that information uh, in the notes. So if, if anyone's listening and didn't get that, uh, but Nita Patel. Uh, thank you, Nita, for being on here. Any last words of wisdom, advice, anything you want to throw out? Um, you know, I would say elevating your life really changes your day-to-day -day experiences. And um, instead of focusing on, we still have to chase those big goals and dreams, but those are not the big things that, you know, where I think we think that that's the happiness. In reality, the happiness is in our day-to-day -day and how we conduct ourselves every day. That's where the daily experiences that we can create for ourselves are. And that's where the inner peace and joy can come from. And so if you just make these small shifts in your life to elevate yourself, you'll find that joy and happiness and peace every day. And you don't have to, you know, wait until you meet this big milestone and, you know, chase the next milestone. Well, well thank you, Natel. Um, and Nita, sorry, I want to tell. Put, put your put first and last name together. Thank you, Nita, for... Uh, for being on the Road to Growth podcast. Hopefully the listeners got some great information. And again, your etiquette might not be the best, maybe like mine. And so I'm gonna have to, to reach out to Nita uh, in the future. Thank you everyone for listening.